Hello, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started here in just a second. Thank you all for being here. If you're still wandering in, that's fine. Grab your lunch, grab a drink, sit wherever you like. Um, most of you know me, so I'll just briefly introduce myself from the Center for Women in Ministry in case you don't know me before or haven't been to one of our events. I'm Anna Russell. I'm a Beeson alum. I am the events coordinator here, and I also direct our Center for Women in Ministry, who is, which is hosting this event. So this is one of our um, two or three semesterly events that we do, and this time we've invited our very own Dr. Stefana Lang, who's a faculty member here at Beeson. She teaches, yes, give her a round of applause. Yeah. You know her, you love her. She graciously agreed to come and do this even while she's actually currently on sabbatical. So we're very thankful for her taking time out of her sabbatical to come and speak to us today. Um, but Stefana, she teaches in the areas of spiritual formation, church history, um, and she is the perfect person to discuss our topic today, which is women in church history. Um, if you've been through the Beeson curriculum, you probably know lots and lots about men in church history and some women. They show up in your history and doctrine classes, but this will be a little bit more of a deep dive where you can get introduced to other women who you may not have heard of um, and have a little more options of where to look if you want to learn more about them. With that being said, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lang. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. It's good to see you. I'm, um, I'm glad to be here today. Um, Glad to see this uh, interest in this topic. Hey, Tony. <laughs> um, yeah, I, ha I haven't seen some of your faces for a while, and I've seen other faces pretty recently at the Beeson Retreat. And um, yeah, had a, a good time together there. Um, can I just have by a show of hands, um, how many here are uh, from outside of Beeson? OK. Um, there is another handout coming around. I know that there is a bibliography that came around. Uh, I'm also the theological librarian for the Divinity School, so of course there's a bibliography and a stack of books right here next to me. Um, but those are resources for further study, further reading. And um, there's another sheet coming out, um, coming around with names and dates and things like that. So I realized um, a, a tiny bit last minute that if I'm going to introduce you to a lot of people that you don't already know, um, you might want to know how to how to spell their names um, because there's no PowerPoint. And I'm very um, very closely acquainted with these uh, with these ladies, and um, I'm excited to share them with you. Well, um, I want you to feel confident that I have uh, received the assignment from Anna, and I've read the assignment, I understand the assignment. As I understand it, um, <laughs> as I understand it, there are basically three things that were advertised um, as being a part of this session. I want to stay true to those. Um, what about our church mothers, which I take to be asking basically, where are they? <laughs> um, and maybe why haven't I been hearing about them? Second, who are the women who have most shaped church history? Who are the women? And third, what can we learn from them? So I hope that these three things are the reason that you are here. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, not address these in order, but they will all be addressed. So um, what I want to do is to kind of dive into the second one, who are the women? And um, I do have, and I, I want to leave time for, um, some comments about what about the church mothers? Um, where are they? How come maybe you haven't heard of a lot of them? Um, why maybe aren't they featuring more um, prominently in your class, in the class material, et cetera? And I've got some answers there, and I've got some suggestions there, maybe some challenges there, and uh, I hope that I will have time to um, address that. But I'll do that at the end, because I don't want to just talk about that and leave out the, the actual people, <laughs> right? All right. Um, last year, about this time, I was asked to uh, teach a discipleship class at my church, and um, I was asked to teach a Bible study, and I told them, you know, I think 
lots of women at this church could do a Bible study. Uh, I'm going to do something else that I think only I can do for our church. And uh, I'm going to take you on a little tour of women in the ancient church. And we did an eight-week study, and it uh, could have been 10, probably could have been 12. Um, but that, to me, kind of highlights the fact that there are, um, you know, where some people might say, well, where are they all? And to me, I think there are so many. <laughs> there are so many, but you need to know where to find the sources. And, you know, I know where to find the sources, and I um, try to pull them out and um, talk about them, introduce them to women who don't even necessarily enjoy history or antiquity, um, but um, who are reading the same Bible that these women of the past were reading and are trying to walk a path of discipleship faithfully, um, just as these women of the past had done. And so um, what I... Uh, what you probably will see in the second sheet that came around that has a list of names is an outline of my course. So I, I pulled that together just pretty quickly for you to have the names so they don't necessarily go in the order in which we're talking about today. So today I want to kind of take these women um, roughly in chronological order. So we'll just be jumping, just, just be aware that we're going to be um, jumping around just a tiny bit. So, so who are the women who have most shaped church history? And who have most shaped church history requires a bit of definition, and that's part of what uh, we'll want to kind of talk about at the end. So uh, these are women who were martyrs, about whom we have documentation, plenty of it. They were mothers, sisters, monastics. Sometimes they founded a monastery, a monastic institution. Sometimes those are called anchoresses. Um, or foundresses, or they might be abbesses, right? The counterpart of an abbot, those who are leading a monastic institution who are uh, giving direction there. Um, sometimes their influence can't be measured in terms of theological and doctrinal or textual contributions. This is part of the reason why maybe you haven't heard of a lot of them. But their influence, rather, is measured in terms of um, uh, their social status, uh, influence in family members, influence through charity, through um, uh, use of their money to benefit the church in various ways, not, not just always church buildings, but also, you know, like parachurch ministries invested a lot of money into those um, in terms of their spiritual influence in their family and um, among disciples, and in terms of their sanctity, as exemplars of holiness. So how can we know more about them? Where is this information found? Well, um, a lot of it is found in um, uh, martyrologies, in documents um, that talk about the interrogation, or documents that are the interrogation of, um, of female martyrs. It's found in letters, personal letters, right, among their family members. Um, it's found in um, liturgical documents. It's found in inscriptions, in monastic and ascetic works like um, holy biographies. So if you've been in my patristics class, you've read at least one of those, uh, Life of Macrina. It's found in artwork. It's found on coinage. So you've got to look in some places that are not the traditional sources that we study at seminary or at divinity schools. All right, so um, it's, it's hard for me to say, like, who is the most influential? <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just uh, start in my list here, and we will talk about a few. I'm going to start with, um, actually, Perpetua, because I think you maybe already know some things about her. Uh, of course, she's in our dome, Perpetua and Felicitas. And um, as we look at kind of each one of these women, I want to kind of pull out um, a bit about their story in context and, um, you know, what we, what we learn from them, right? What we derive from them. So Perpetua and Felicitas um, belong to the same household. Perpetua is an aristocratic girl. She's about 22. Felicitas is her servant. And the date of their martyrdom is 203 AD. So 
they're you know just just on the cusp right there of the um, third century, and they are living in Carthage in um, modern day Tunisia. The source text for that, the Passion of Perpetua and Felicitas, available uh, to be you know to be read in um, in English, both English and in Latin. If you uh, if you read Latin, um, what I want to bring out here though just as a little bit of context. Um, Perpetua and Felicitas are arrested um, as they have been attending a kind of a Bible study catechism class uh, in their neighborhood. And um, the two of them had converted at a time when it was illegal to convert. It wasn't necessarily illegal to be a Christian, but to convert at that time, right? That's why there are other Christians in that account who are not immediately arrested, but Perpetua and Felicitas and some others who were in that Bible study group um, are arrested and are imprisoned. And as Perpetua and Felicitas and others are learning their catechism, they're learning about the Trinity, they're learning about one God, the Father, creator of all things, one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, who suffered for them and in whose footsteps they also are shortly to follow. Also about, though, the Holy Spirit who empowers the church and who unifies and strengthens believers. And the reason I bring this out is because it's brought out in the account, right? The Holy Spirit is, is, is large and loud <laughs> in this account. Um, training in Christian living was um, very much needed um, in this century. Christians needed to stand out for good things, for good reasons, right? Um, and so ethics was an important part of their witness. And they were not just trained in ethics, but also in um, sort of the, the kinds of skills that they needed, survival skills, uh, in order to withstand persecution. So uh, what is the story then of Perpetua and Felicitas? Well, um, it's a uh, firsthand account. It's Perpetua's diary. Um, this is you know, a, a, a text written by a woman, um, pretty unique at this period of time, um, but it is Perpetua's diary of um, her, her experience in prison. And there is a, an intro on the front and, and an epilogue on the back, which are a lot of people think written by Tertullian. I think there might be some disagreement around there, but, um, but that's, I think, um, the majority consensus. And so in the intro, the editor is emphasizing God's amazing works in the present as much as those great deeds of old in the Bible. It's the same spirit that empowers all who are gods, both men and women, saints of old, New Testament saints, and also the saints in Carthage. Um, Perpetua then is uh, a 22-year-old aristocratic woman who, along with Felicitas, are um, arrested. Their teacher turns, uh, turns himself in eventually, and they're all held together in jail. Um, Perpetua has a nursing newborn. Felicitas is eight months pregnant. So these are, you know, these are new moms, um, soon-to-be moms. And what this text gives us is insight into Christian women's experience of persecution. Uh, also gives us insight into family conflicts that arose due to faith choices. Um, also, how the church saw itself and its identity in light of the Bible and the reality of God's kingdom in conflict with what the Bible calls the ruler of this world. And so what we have from this account, in this account, um, we have the account of some very encouraging heavenly visions that are given in order to encourage the martyrs. And um, the kinds of things that Perpetua sees in her dreams um, are kind of a window into the North African church. It's a very vibrant church, a bit on the charismatic side. And um, Perpetua's uh, visions, the dreams that the Lord gives her, are very, very vivid and vibrant. Um, it also shows how these women are taking on new identities. So Perpetua herself is shifting from being a daughter of Rome, a daughter of Carthage, a daughter of a father who honestly loves her, has invested a lot in her, 
has um, um, given her an education, which is a little bit of, a, of an oddity uh, at that time, that kind of an investment in a daughter. But she's shifting from a daughter of Carthage to a daughter of God. And, you know, you can imagine Felicitas, you know, she's a slave, she's a servant, she's a nobody, and, you know, her identity is shifting to be the daughter of a king, you know? And both of them together are living into these new identities. They have a powerful heavenly father to whom they are going. So both of their stories are touching, are moving, are powerful, and what we see from them is how believers saw themselves, not necessarily as victims, but as victors, right? And um, also how they're stepping into the promises of the scripture, especially stepping into the promises of the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain them as they're interrogated before government authorities, and also to sustain them as they suffer, literally suffer, um, in the arena, as these girls and their friends are thrown to the beasts and then are um, executed by the sword. So Perpetua and Felicitas. Um, I could talk about two other very famous um, martyrdoms. Um, I don't know if we have time for that, but I'll just mention them. Their stories are also um, pretty amazing. One of them is a woman named Blandina, who died in 177 in a very famous account called The Martyrs of Lyon and Vienne. Um, she is um, kind of a, a visual um, encouragement to the martyrs who were in the arena suffering all kinds of different tortures and torments. Um, at one point, as you know, the pagans see that she is um, encouraging them, kind of, kind of cheering on uh, the martyrs, they hang her from a stake and they kind of hang her with their hands up. And the martyrs, of course, look at her and they see Christ. They see the suffering Christ. Um, and so they're even more encouraged. So Blandina is um, just a, a, an amazing example, an amazing story. Um, another one is, uh, this one went over really well, actually, with the people at my church, the ladies at my church. It is the story of the um, martyrs of Thessaloniki. Uh, these are um, Agape, Keone, and Irene. You can read their stories, you know, available in translation. Um, and these women, I think, are uh, remarkable for um, the witness that they bore as they were pressured to give up copies of the scriptures. So at the time that they were, uh, at the time that they lived, um, somewhere near um, Istanbul, modern-day Istanbul, um, uh, there was a policy that required Christians to hand over the sacred scriptures. And these girls uh, probably knew that agents were coming to their home. They literally locked the house and ran for the hills. <laughs> and they lived, uh, they lived outdoors for almost a year before they were caught. They were apprehended. They were um, uh, imprisoned, and they were put on trial. Uh, two of them were killed by being burned alive pretty quickly after interrogation. Um, there were five others, seven total. There were five others who were remanded in custody for different reasons. They couldn't be um, executed right away. Some of them were uh, minors, what we'd call minors, and too young to be executed in the arena, and others were pregnant. And uh, so it's, it's interesting, you know, as you kind of think about the similarities with Felicitas, who um, couldn't be uh, executed because she was still pregnant, and so she prayed to deliver the night before the um, the execution. So you've got the same sort of thing here with these um, martyrs of Thessaloniki. Um, one of these women named Irene is singled out, interrogated, and then punished by being placed naked in a brothel to be raped. Um, as it happens, she's not touched, and uh, she's then recalled to trial and sentenced to death and executed by being burned alive, just like the previous, um, the previous women. And um, this particular account is written um, like it's a little bit like it's a script. So you've got the name and then the answer. The name, the answer. You have the interrogator saying, you know, do you recant, Irene? And she says, no, I'm a Christian. And what about you, um, uh, Keone? No, I'm a Christian. 
And so that's kind of how the whole thing reads. And what I asked my ladies to do was to each volunteer to take um, a part, to take a name. And it was uh, very amazing and moving to hear these um, ancient testimonies uh, under persecution, under duress, coming in the voices of these women in my church who I know. Um, and it, it, was, it was very powerful. They enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but you know, hearing their words of courage in the familiar voices of, of these women means that their sacrifice and their testimony continues to ring out and bear witness to sacrificial discipleship as an encouraging and convicting example for future generations. So the next person I'm going to talk about is uh, Queen Helena. So if, as we're going a little bit chronologically, um, from about the um, early, uh, or sorry, late, fourth, late third century to early fourth century, there was a system of government known as the Tetrarchy set up by the Emperor Diocletian. So between 293 and 312, this was the case. And so what you had, you had to divide up the, um, the empire into four so that it's more manageable. I mean, it's going from, from Britain and Spain all the way to basically Syria, okay? B huge span. So it was divided into four. Um, uh, there were two Augustuses, two Augusti, who each had a Caesar. And they ruled the empire in cities like York, all the way um, in, in Britain, uh, Rome, Germany, Istanbul, and Thessalonica. So the Caesar of the far west was a guy named Constantius Chlorus, who was the father of the future emperor Constantine. He's also the husband of Queen Helena. So after legalizing Christianity, Constantine turned to settling doctrinal issues arising in the church, culminating in the Council of Nicaea and its creed, 325. So I think you, know, you, you should be familiar. <laughs> I think most people in the room are familiar with that history. Um, afterwards, Constantine turned his attention to Christianizing the empire through an enormous and extensive building program. And Helena, his mother, who had been the wife of Constantius Chlorus, or sometimes called his consort, was instrumental in Constantine's achievements to Christianize the empire in this way. So there, there are some biographical uncertainties surrounding her, but basically what we have, bits and pieces from fourth century historians, fourth and fifth century historians, is this. Um, Helena is born um, in Turkey, in a place that was uh, named Helenopolis in her honor. Helenopolis. She married Constantius, who was a soldier, an excellent leader. She was probably set aside for some decades. We don't know exactly her, her background, but she might have come from not an aristocratic background, married a soldier. She watched her son, Constantine, rise as a skilled soldier and leader, living in both the East and the West. Helena converted to Christianity. We don't know if it was before Constantine or you know, at the same time, we don't know. But what we do know is that she took her faith very seriously and became a willing and enthusiastic partner with the emperor in locating and honoring the sacred places of her new faith. So we're talking about archeological discovery here in the Holy Land. Okay, how many of you have been to Israel? How many have been in the Holy Land? Okay. Well, we all owe a lot to Helena and to her work in the early fourth century. And well, and to Constantine funding it by state funds, <laughs> by public funds. So between 325 and 328, or 29, she died in uh, 28, 29. But those last several years of her life, she was very active in locating sacred spaces, places, building churches, and gathering together relics. In 326, we read that she locates the site of Calvary, the site of the True Cross. Um, she found some nails. She found Pilate's inscription, and she commissions the building of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. She also distributed pieces of the cross to other cities where they were placed and hosted in various churches. So for example, there is a piece of the cross um, at a church in Rome called the Church of Santa Croce in Jerusalem. So the Holy Cross from Jerusalem, there's a piece of it there 
um, as a relic in this church in Rome, pretty, pretty close to the um, Roman Forum. Subsequently, uh, Helena locates the cave where Jesus traditionally met with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, a cave where he, like when, you know, they'd go back and forth between Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives. So traditionally there's a kind of a, a cave. And have you seen Jesus Christ Superstar? <laughs> you know the, you know the what's the buzz, tell me what to happen in, where they're kind of down in a cave. This might be a generational thing. I don't know. But, but that, that feels to me kind of like this. So there's, there's a cave um, called the Eleona, uh, above which a church was built. Okay, so the church of the Eleona. Um, Helena next goes to find the cave of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Uh, based on local tradition, she uh, um, finds the site and builds the church of the Nativity. And this is going to be important for people who come chronologically later um, uh, uh, in our discussion today. Uh, Helena lived very modestly. She acted firmly, generously. She was a servant of God's people and a benefactor to the poor. Constantine honored her with the title of Augusta. He stamped her image on the coinage at the time. That's why I say, you know, some of the sources that we have about women are on the coins, right? It's, it's called, that's called numismatics, right? Um, and sometimes you have women's names and images stamped on there about whom we know nothing else. We don't have them in any other documents, okay? Helena died with her son at her bedside, and she was buried in a mausoleum in Rome built by Constantine. So big contribution there. You know, was she literate? I'm not sure. Did she write something? I'm not sure. Uh, not a bishop, didn't preach any sermons, but we owe her still today. If you go to the Holy Land, you see a lot of her contribution um, that is there. All right. Uh, next, um, after the legalization of the church, of course, Christianity is encouraged, leading to an explosion of doctrinal development with famous thinkers, writers, Bible teachers, and translators, and preachers, um, a lot of them traveling around the empire. Um, many of these very famous people are related to the women uh, who we are talking about today. So there are a lot of scholars and Bible teachers moving around. Um, at this time, late fourth century. Also though, the memories of the martyrs are still pretty fresh uh, because some of the older generations still have memories of uh, the time of persecution. And since martyrdom had been a heroic ideal, people were still looking for ways to honor the martyrs and their sacrifice for Jesus and to find ways of sacrificial discipleship in their own lives in these new circumstances of freedom. So this is important for the next people that we're going to talk about. So people are pursuing communal living and like-minded spiritual practice, uh, you know, like this community of sisters that we just visited in Coleman for those who went on, on the retreat. So this, uh, this practice is going on either in groups, in the desert, or in open spaces far from the cities, and people are finding ways to engage in charitable work and asceticism imitating or rec recreating the desert ideal. So we're going to talk about um, Marcella and Paula of Rome. Marcella and Paula are wealthy women who are pursuing biblical study and Christian living, trying to live an, an ascetic life in their homes in Rome. Um, they are, when I say they're wealthy women, I mean they're generationally wealthy, they're exceedingly wealthy. Their homes are like palatial residences. They're like huge mansions. Um, there was a, a district in Rome on what's called the, the Palatine Hill. From the Palatine Hills, where we get the word palace. <laughs> so that's where a lot of these um, high-ranking aristocratic men and women lived. Um, widowhood and wealth gives these women freedom to travel to lands of the Bible. Marcella doesn't travel, but Paula does. She later moves to Bethlehem, and she establishes monastic communities in Palestine, along with a church father named Jerome. 
So the documents about this are actually two very long letters by Jerome. Um, one is called the life of Marcella and the other is called the life of Paula. Um, he doesn't call them, you know, the life of this. We, we've called them that now uh, because his letter is kind of like a, um, a eulogy in the form of a letter. So let's talk about Marcella first. Marcella is a wealthy widow who loved Bible study and she took every opportunity to learn it and pass it on to other aristocratic Roman women. She taught them and she discipled them. And Paula and Paula's daughter Eustochium, I think it's her eldest daughter, were among Marcella's disciples, as was a younger woman named Principia who lived with Marcella and some other young women. Marcella was the first, Jerome tells us, to embark on the ascetic ideal among these aristocratic circles. Um, she was fascinated and inspired by desert asceticism that was publicized by Christian writers from Egypt and Syria who were familiar with that lifestyle. So that lifestyle, kind of like a, a, a living martyrdom, right, uh, is sometimes called the bloodless martyrdom, bloodless martyrdom. In, in uh, AD 410, the Roman Empire, and Rome specifically, was invaded and pillaged by the Visigoths under their king, Alaric. They broke into homes and robbed them, and Marcella was among those who was robbed and attacked. She and Principia, who, were, who was living with her, were taken to a church for shelter and refuge, and although Principia survived, um, and Marcella survived too, that attack, but just a few months later, she passed away from, from her injuries. So um, she had a, um, a, a modest appearance. She dressed kind of on the ideal of what we might call um, the widow ideal um, that we see in Timothy in the pastorals. Um, you know, some of the women at my church, um, when they hear this description that Jerome gives of how Marcella looked and, and Paula as well, you know, how they dressed and you know, just like dark clothes and they were cheap and you know, didn't wear any makeup. And they said, where, you know, where do they get that? <laughs> where do they get that? Where, where do they get the idea that that's how Christian women should look? Well, you know, actually in the pastoral epistles, you know, actually in the Bible, you know. And so, I mean, this is a reason why Jerome, um, Jerome makes a big deal of this. So, you know, among aristocratic women who are, you know, um, going to the spa, and um, dressing in beautiful silken robes um, as a way to represent their, um, their noble family line, to represent their husbands. You know, um, you might be embarrassed if you're not wearing the finest, and she wasn't. She, was, she had an ideal in her mind, a scriptural ideal, um, a um, ascetic ideal, and she wasn't ashamed to live it out, and she attracted a number of other women, including um, Paula and Eustochium. So what we remember about her mainly is um, her discipleship, her self-denial, her biblical study, her intellectual prowess, and her friendship with Jerome. Um, she would frequently ask him questions, um, scriptural questions, interpret, um, questions of uh, biblical interpretation. And Jerome says that it was to the point where she was known for um, her, her intellectual and biblical literacy and for her acumen in interpreting um, you know, scriptural issues that uh, clergy would come and ask her because they knew that she had spent time with Jerome. And Jerome says um, when they would ask her a question, she would say something like, well, if Jerome were here, he would answer it like this. And Jerome said, um, you know, she didn't really ask me all of that. She, that was her own answer, but she was just cloaking it, <laughs> you know, so that it would be accepted, <laughs> accepted by the clergy who uh, maybe didn't want to be taught by a woman. All right, so, um, so then to Paula, her friend Paula. Um, so again, we have the life of Paula uh, by Jerome. It's a letter that Jerome writes in memory of Paula to Paula's daughter, Eustochium. And, uh, you know, what is Paula's story? Well, Paula is also an aristocratic widow. Um, her family lineage is celebrated and noble. It's, it's ridiculously noble. <laughs> um, through her mother, she is related to military heroes like the guy Scipio Africanus, 
who conquered Hannibal. You know, Hannibal and his elephants, you know, in the Carthaginian War than the Punic Wars, right? Well, her forebear conquered um, Hannibal. Uh, also, on, another, on the other side of her family, her lineage goes back to apparently the legendary Agamemnon, one of the conquerors of Troy. Um, through her husband's lineage, they trace back to Aeneas, the Aeneas, right? Another hero of Troy, and also to the clan of the Julii, uh, from whom Julius Caesar was born. Uh, even so, as Jerome gives us the life of Paula, as he is writing about her, he constantly praises her for putting aside this honor. Right? That's a point of that would be a point of pride for anybody. But she sets aside this honor. She sets aside this wealth and nobility. She chooses rather poverty for the sake of Christ. She chooses lowliness and humility, joining rather those who, he says, have left all for his sake and who will receive, this is Jesus, not necessarily J Jerome, but he quotes it, who will receive a hundredfold now in this time and in the world to come eternal life. So this was her goal. Right? This was her vision. And Jerome highlights the kinds of reversals that came in her life with um, becoming a believer, shunning fame, shunning wealth and glory. He said she has earned fame, spiritual wealth, and the glory that comes from virtue. So this kind of life or self-denial was seen as a discipleship that's in a way equivalent to martyrdom. Paula bore five children, several of whom predeceased her. Um, once she had born a son, you know, it's like she fulfilled her duty now, there's the heir, and uh, once her husband had passed away, Paula, in her great grief, um, kind of threw herself into helping others and into doing charity work. Um, during a church synod in Rome in 382, so one year after the Council of Constantinople, she met and hosted some of the great theologians and bishops and churchmen, like Jerome, who were invited to participate in this council in 382. She's probably influenced by their way of life, by their stories of lands of the Bible and the monks living in Egypt and in Israel, in Syria. And so she decides that she's going to go on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So under the desire to see places that she was studying about with Marcella and other Christian women in Rome, she goes to the Holy Land. She's visiting some of the very places that Helena had commissioned to build. Um, eventually, she settles in Bethlehem, and she decided there to fund and to found, to establish a monastic complex there for men and women, administered by her and by Jerome. And after her death, it was administered by her daughter, Eustochium. And after Eustochium's death, it was administered then by Paula's granddaughter, also named Paula. This is Paula the Younger. So it's interesting to see in these aristocratic families how the faith and work in the church, for the church, is passed down um, from generation to generation. This complex that she and Jerome founded and managed adjoined the Church of the Nativity which, of course, is built by, was built by Helena. And uh, Jerome and Paula and Eustochium all were buried in the crypt of this church, although Jerome's remains were later transferred to the church of Maria Maggiore in Rome. So um, I think I've said enough of you know, the exemplary nature of, um, of Paula's life, um, her, her discomfort with an affluent life, her wish to withdraw, um, her her um, life of pilgrimage and her humility, um, her life of chastity, of modesty, of generosity, these are the kinds of things that, um, that have come down to us from Paula. Now, Jerome highlights Paula and her abilities in biblical study. And this is very important to Jerome. He has special reason to be grateful to Paula and I mean, you read this letter about Paula's life. He's falling all over himself to praise her. But he has special reason to appreciate her, not just because she put up with him. And he was, he was a piece of work, honestly. Um, but also because her wealth created the monastic community that housed and honored him as a biblical scholar who translated the Bible from 
original languages into Latin. So before him, the Old Testament was, it was translated into Latin, but not in a very smooth translation. It was a, a translation that, for, for example, Augustine, who, you know, in his younger years, picked up the Bible to read it, and he said, oh, it's not, it's not like, it's not Cicero. You know, he set it aside. Well, Jerome translated, he made a good, smooth translation in, um, in Latin, um, directly from the Hebrew, not from the Greek Septuagint. And Paula was his assistant, and she was his supporter, and she funded not just this project of Bible translation, but also many other translation projects as well. And this will become important for our last person, who I pray I will get to before the time runs out. <laughs> okay, um, the next person I want to look at is Macrina, and not just Macrina, but Macrina and her mother, Emilia. Um, these women live in Turkey, and these women are related to um, people who we call the Cappadocians, to the Cappadocian fathers, um, uh, to Gregory of Nyssa, um, Basil, and um, um, Peter of Sebasti. Uh, these are Macrina's brothers. These are Emilia's sons. Macrina is the oldest sibling. She's the big sister, and um, uh, I wanted to uh, I wanted to kind of read a little bit about their reputation, okay, that goes beyond the life of Macrina. And some of you have read the life of Macrina because um, you had no choice because I signed it in my class. But, um, but I want you to hear just a little bit about their um, reputation even outside of that document. And this is from, um, this is from a work called um, Epigrams, Epigrams of Gregory of Nazianzen. So the life of Macrina is written by her own brother, Gregory of Nyssa. And a couple of these epigrams, epigrams are written by Gregory of Nazianzen, their friend, a third Cappadocian. Uh, okay, here's one for um, after the death of Emilia. Emilia is dead. Who would have thought it? She who gave life to the light of so many and such children, both sons and daughters, married and unmarried. She alone among mortals had both good children and many children. Three of her sons were illustrious priests, and one daughter the companion of a priest, and the rest were like an army of saints. An army of saints. Here's another one on Amelia. I marveled when I looked on Amelia's offspring, so great and of such kind, all the wealth of her mighty womb. But when I noted that she was Christ's possession, she also was a Christian, of pious blood, had been brought up a Christian. This is what I said, no wonder, no wonder she's like this, the root is so great. Right? She has been rooted in Christianity. This is the holy recompense of your piety, O best of women, the honor of your children for whom you had but one desire. All right, one, for, one on the occasion of Macrina's death. The dust holds the illustrious virgin Macrina, if you've ever heard something about her, the firstborn of the great Amelia. But she who kept herself from the eyes of all men is now on the tongues of all and has a glory greater than any. Okay, she who kept herself away from the eyes of men. Yeah, she was looking for seclusion not fame or popularity, not glory. She wasn't traveling. She didn't even go to the Holy Land like some of these others. But um, her life is written by her brother Gregory, probably a year or a bit more after her death. Um, her death hit him very hard, especially since their brother Basil had died uh, earlier the same year. So Macrina is born as the first child of nine or ten children into a wealthy aristocratic Christian family known for having suffered for the faith through land confiscation in the persecutions of the um, late third and early fourth century. And they were also known, their family was also known for their generosity and for their philanthropy. Melania had been, Gregory says, a beautiful girl, homeschooled with a biblical curriculum, schooled by her father in um, philosophy and by her mother, in um, uh, Christian vocation. She helped her mother care for her siblings, raising the boys, marrying off most of the girls. One of them remained celibate and also overseeing the family's vast pr 
properties. She was especially close to Gregory, uh, who calls her the teacher, the great one, the great Macrina. She was also very close to Peter, who was the baby, who she raised into maturity, uh, schooling him in piety. Um, so uh, Macrina also, I, I say here, she schooled, <laughs> she homeschooled Peter, she also schooled uh, Basil by confronting him for his pride uh, after he came home from his Ivy League education in Athens, where he had been a student with his friend Gregory and also with the future emperor Julian. But while he'd been away, Macrina and Amelia had turned the family estate into a monastery. And this is where you can kind of see um, influence on um, Basil and what he will later do. I mean, he also will be over a monastery. Um, they turned the family estate into a community consisting of the family members who were still at home and all the servants who had been freed, right? They had all been manumitted, plus some women who had been displaced by a famine and had been wandering past their estate looking for shelter. So eventually their family estate became a double monastery um, administered by Macrina and Peter. And so um, as the story is told and as um, Gregory is talking about each one of their family members, basically he's kind of characterizing all of them in terms of their charitable work, their charitable endeavors. So we might think like, you know, people who are just secluded in a monastic place, they're, you know, what are they doing? Like what mission are they doing? What are they accomplishing out there just, just um, uh, on the sidelines? But he says Nocratius was characterized by um, uh, elder care, uh, Emilia by her humility in freeing the servants. Peter was great at administration and known for generosity, especially after he had uh, become the bishop of a church. Basil uh, founded an entire hospital, and uh, Macrina herself was known uh, far and wide by her hospitality and her holiness. And in fact, her um, uh, family estate became not just a monastic institution, but also kind of a retreat center, <laughs> kind of like what we, um, what we experienced um, last weekend. So um, my time is starting to run down, but I want to, um, I want to talk, I, I want to make just a few comments about um, like where are these church mothers and why are we not hearing about them? I'm skipping over um, Augustine's mother, Monica, which I know you'll all read about, and I know that you'll enjoy it. Um, and also, uh, Diary of a Pilgrimage by a woman in Egeria, who probably was a Spanish nun who also traveled to the Holy Land and left us um, a diary of her pilgrimage. All right. She described lots and lots of um, liturgical rituals and, and things that went on there at Easter time and left those for us um, just to, you know, to, to be informed about what was happening um, uh, in the center of Christianity there in Jerusalem. So, you know, just kind of to, to round this out, you know, where are the church mothers? And, and I hope that you can hear me say they're in plain sight. They're in plain sight. Um, and so I, I just want to offer some of my own thoughts on maybe why we're not really seeing them. Um, I think one, one thing to consider is defining terms. So when we talk about the church fathers, you know, who are we talking about? What, who qualifies as a church father? So usually we're referring to, to a person who produced theological or apologetic or homiletical materials. Many of them wrote prolifically material that was intended for publication, for broad circulation. Some material was clearly intended for posterity. And so, um, you know, women weren't writing this kind of material. So um, as we think about maybe our curriculum here, the curriculum of divinity schools, of theological institutions where we study theology and doctrinal texts, we tend to define the church fathers according to their contributions in doctrine, in theology that is transmitted through text to also include homilies, which were frequently inscribed by assistants, you know, sitting there in the, in the front pew. They were edited and preserved in monastic or Episcopal libraries women are not writing, well, they're not preaching, and they're not writing these kinds of texts in the early centuries. And the texts that they wrote were not for public circulation, are not necessarily for public consumption. So what did women write? Well, taking a step back, firstly, their education is uneven. 
Some of them are not literate. Most are educated in the domestic sphere to have a domestic or a family career. If their mother was educated, she could educate her daughter. Or in a wealthy family, they could hire a tutor if the father gave permission to hire a tutor. Um, second, if and when they wrote, the kinds of documents they produced tended to be personal works, like Perpetua's diary, or a travel account intended as a community letter to a feminine community. This is what Egeria is writing. Or devotional journaling, right? Um, a woman named Melania, who I don't even have time to talk about, <laughs> um, uh, has written just you know her, her devotional um, thoughts from her Bible study, her Bible reading, her reading of sermons, her reading of the church fathers. We, we don't have any of those available, none of them that have survived. We may also see some women involved in church politics. They're behind the scenes. Um, there's, there are empresses and royal women uh, who surely were educated. They surely wrote things. They were involved in the, in the writing or production of documents, but they, they ruled in the background. They were writing under somebody else's name, right? They couldn't, uh, many times they couldn't act on their own. But for example, um, uh, uh, pushing back against Nestorianism, the victory over Nestorianism, that had to be fought for. The Theotokos, that had to be fought for. And it was uh, in the palace by the Empress Pulcheria, who didn't write any theological works. So what can we learn from them? You know, this, is the last, this is the last thing that Anna asked uh, asked me about what can we learn from them? Well, we can't easily package the material for an answer to this question, but I think that we've gathered up what we have received from them as we've walked through this biographical intro of women. A lot of others are left out, but I hope that your curiosity has been aroused. I hope that your imagination has been stimulated, that your appetite has been whetted to investigate, to engage in research, to engage these women through research, and also to integrate them into the vision, into your vision of ministry, and into your vision and understanding your concept of the family tree of the church, and to access these documents and this material as resources for ministry, for discipleship. And I hope that you um, have been stimulated in your interest in these topics for integration into your studies. Thank you. <laughs>